praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he, he is thy health and salvation. Would you turn in your hymnal to number 319? Let's stand and join our voices in worship this day. Please join me as we pray together. We praise you, almighty God. You are our health and salvation. We have heard your word. We have experienced your love. Now we have been drawn to your temple to offer praise in glad adoration. Transform us, we pray as we enter into your presence today. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Welcome to the worship of God at Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. I am so glad to welcome you on this day as we come to worship God at the beginning of a very big and special week in the life of our church. If you haven't already noticed by walking through the hallways we we have vacation Bible school this week and it's going to be a great time as we learn about how God rescues us when lives are shipwrecked. I am grateful for all those who are participating in leadership for the students who are coming it's going to be a great week. Remember that on Wednesday night we have no Wednesday night activities because of the Bible school activities during the week. But then next Sunday, next Sunday, we will have a VBS fun day following worship. 
That's an opportunity for you to enjoy the fellowship of the whole church family as we go over to the Family Life Center, enjoy good food together. You're invited to be a part of that next Sunday. You will see more information about Vacation Bible School and other activities in the life of our church in your worship bulletin. I encourage you to uh, take that, read it closely, learn about what is happening in our church. If you're a guest with us today, we're so glad that you're here and would love to receive a little information from you so that we can share some information about the life of our church. There's a card in the pew rack just in front of you. Fill that out, drop it in the offering plate, and that will give us a chance to get to know you. Or we would love to invite you after worship, just back there out those doors, there's a welcome table. Love to have you stop by that table and give us the chance to share some information with you. For those of you who are worshiping by television or online, we're just delighted that you have come into our sanctuary today from wherever you are, that we might worship God together. This morning we're thinking about a God who delivers us from our struggles. Psalm 34 reminds us of this God. Let me read selections from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against evildoers to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and rescues them from all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord rescues them from them all.
It is a privilege to oftentimes introduce you all uh, to those that we partner with and work with and support as we do missions ministry here in Atlanta and around the world. And today we have two very special guests who are with us. And so I'd like to invite uh, Paul and Elizabeth Musser to come and join me here. Uh, you will see a word about them in your order of worship, uh, but they're coming to tell you more about what they do. So I'm going to wait and let them say uh, more about who they are and what they do. Uh, but know that these are two who are normally not in this country, but spend other, their time in other parts of the world as missionaries, working with missionaries, and our folks and friends that we have known for a long time and have supported and worked with uh, prayerfully, relationally, and financially through our missions offering. Uh, but Paul and Elizabeth, we welcome you gladly and just look forward to hearing more from you. So welcome. Thank you. <coughs> Bonjour. Quel plaisir d'être parmi vous ce matin. Hi, y'all. <laughs> it's great to be back at Second Ponce again. So I grew up at Second Ponce, the daughter of Jerry and Barbara Goldsmith, and this church has played an integral part in my faith journey since I was a little girl. At nine, I walked the aisle to accept Christ as my personal savior and was baptized. I was very involved in the Speedle Youth Group and the Youth Choir as a teenager. And the two-week missions trips I took with the youth choir were the highlight of my year. Little did I know that the Lord was preparing me for a lifetime in missions. When, in 1982, I headed into short-term missions after just having um, graduated from college, my beloved father, who's sitting over there, was a bit surprised. But mom, in her typically forthright way, said that she always thought I'd either marry a Baptist preacher or be a missionary. Way back in 1982, Second Ponce began supporting me through giving and prayers, and that has con continued for the past 35 years. Paul and I were married in this sanctuary 32 years ago, and two years ago, we held a memorial service for, for my mother in this very same sanctuary. I cannot adequa adequately express how thankful we are for the role this church has played in our lives and the lives of the whole Goldsmith Musser clan. My wonderful daddy remains a pillar of Second Ponce, and after three surgeries in the past month, I am so thankful that he is back here today. For all these years, we have been part of a non-denominational mission agency called International Teams, and we personally have worked in three different cities in France. A few months ago, our mission changed its name to One Collective. This name reflects more accurately our mission's goal of bringing people together to help the oppressed. Paul and I have two young adult sons, our millennials. Andrew graduated from Georgia Tech and is an engineer with I Automation. He's married to his college sweetheart, Lacey, and they live outside of Chattanooga with their three children, Jesse five, Najalyn four, and Quinn three. And to be nearer the grandkids for this school year, we've moved about 20 minutes from their house to the booming metropolis of Flintstone, Georgia. Yabba dabba doo. We have yet to see Pebbles and Bam Bam. Our younger son, Chris, just, graduate, just received his MBA with honors from Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and he loves his life in DC. And yes, he has an adorable young lady friend named Ashley who is in law school at Georgetown, and they are both with us today. For most of our years in missions, Paul and I have been involved in helping establish and build up the French Evangelical Church. Eight years ago, our role changed. We're still based in France, in Lyon, France, usually, but we are now involved in pastoral care, what we call pastors to workers, or PTWs. Basically, this means we have oversight for the spiritual well-being of the international team's one collective missionaries living in Europe and in restricted access countries. Additionally, Paul manages a team of other men and women who offer care to one another workers around the globe. We have the great privilege of visiting colleagues who work with refugees, prostitutes, pilgrims, artists, students, and seekers from closed countries. Our goal as PTWs is to help our colleagues be healthy physically, emotionally, spiritually, and psychologically so they can be effective in their ministries. When we find that one is struggling with an issue that needs more than pastoral care, we network with a broad spectrum of professionals to get them that help. Besides visiting each team of workers in their countries of service, we also spend a great deal of time 
on modern technology like WhatsApp, Zoom, Skype to stay in touch. We help our colleagues work through everything from marriage issues to mediation on teams, from encouragement to offering a safe place to vent. We encourage accountability and challenge poor habits. We offer advice, but also get workers in touch with professional help as needed. We respond to reports and issues as they arise. We seek to walk closely enough to our workers in their regular routines so that they know we're a safe, confidential place when they need us. Once again, we want to say a big merci for your support, prayers, and encouragement throughout the years. We agree with the Apostle Paul. We thank our God and my, our every remembrance of you. Let's pray. Father, you are the giver of everything that is good, and we thank you for your provision for your work locally and way beyond the border, these walls and beyond this city and this country, uh, through the giving, through your tithes, through our offerings, through the burdens that you put on the hearts of people here to invest in lives that need to be touched by you. So we bless you. We thank you for your provision for us and our work in ministry for so many years and the many different ways that this church has been able to invest in the lives of oppressed people and those who really just need to hear your gospel. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
the Apostle Paul, late in his ministry, wrote these words to the church meeting at Corinth. For we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars, so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. Let us turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer. O oh, loving God, what a privilege it is indeed to bring all of our prayers to you. In times of thanksgiving, we turn to you and offer voices of praise and celebration and thanks for the ways in which you bless our lives each day. For moments where we are reminded of those blessings and how we take them for granted, we ask forgiveness and for grace. For it is you who guides us and leads us, and it is you who offers us these gifts and these blessings. And although it seems easier to come to you with prayer and celebration and thanksgiving, it is indeed much harder to praise when things are difficult. So God, may we be reminded that you are with us always. We come to this place called sanctuary to be reminded of the way in which you offer us just that. Sanctuary, safe space to come before you, offering ourselves fully to lay before you the things that are hard and difficult, as well as to connect with you around the things that are good and wonderful. God, we know that there are days we enter this space and times we leave this space and our hearts are heavy because there are things in this world working against us that make the days feel long. May your spirit sweep us up in its goodness and in your love and remind us that you are with us always. An ever-present help in times of trouble and need. And so God, this morning we pray for all those who are seeking that comfort. For those in this space, in this sanctuary, who are praying to you, oh God, oh God, Help, comfort, reveal yourself to me. And we pray for those outside of this room who are seeking you, whether they realize it or not. But they are crying out because they continue to face adversity and hardship. The world seems to keep knocking them down May they know how you can pick them back up and set them on their feet and guide them on their path. 
God, moments ago, through the gift of song, we offered these words as they were laid onto our ears, and may they be our prayer in this moment. When peace, like a river, attendeth our way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever our lot, you've taught us to say it is well, it is well with my soul. And even when Satan may buffet and trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded our helpless estate and has shed his own blood for our souls. God, we give you thanks for that blessed assurance. Hold us close in times of need and remind us in this safe space that you are here, that you have been here, and you will always be with us. Loving God is in the name of your Son, our Savior, our sustain, a sustainer, our rock, and our strong foundation. We offer this prayer to you. Amen.
I should probably begin by coming clean and confessing that I have had a complicated relationship with the Apostle Paul. Uh, Paul is, of course, the primary New Testament figure after Jesus. He is the hero missionary who spread the gospel throughout the known world. I am indebted to Paul. I admire him greatly. Undaunted and courageous, legitimate hero of our faith. But I have had a hard time warming up to this guy. He, he's cerebral and driven. He was a fanatic persecutor of Christians before his conversion. And then after he encountered Christ on the road to Damascus, he became an equally wild-eyed missionary. Thinks strategically. He writes long, complicated theological treatments. He's just never struck me as the guy I'd like to spend a weekend with. Uh, don't get me wrong, he's got heart. He's got a great burden for people who do not know Jesus Christ. He dedicated his life with mission and purpose. I just, I just want, you know, a little more. I want to find myself in the biblical characters. I can find myself in Thomas doubting. I can find myself when Peter gets a little hot-headed. When Gideon is in the wine press playing scared, I can see myself. When Leah's picked last because of her looks, I can relate. I have trouble connecting with Paul. If you went back and cataloged all the sermons I have preached since I've been your pastor, you might notice that very few of my sermons are from the letters of Paul, and I'm trying to do better. Today, I'm, I'm trying to do better. But I love the Gospels. I love the Old Testament stories. They have faces Paul doesn't have many faces, not many stories. Paul has theology. Paul has long sentences that are hard to diagram on the board, much less preach. But the Gospels and the narratives, they've got people in action and guys fishing and boys with lunch pails and giants and slingshots. And the Pauline epistles have doctrine. I'm trying. And in seminary, in an effort to try to warm up to Paul a little bit, I took on a research paper titled, Paul's Theology of Forgiveness. Now, Jesus makes so much of forgiveness all through his teaching and preaching, I figured if I got to understand Paul on forgiveness a little better, I might like him a little more. He has virtually nothing on forgiveness. Paul uses transactional language, justification, reconciliation. Jesus talks a relational language of forgiveness. And I love and resonate with that kind of relational word. Paul wants our ledgers to square. He wants our margins to line up. I'm just... I'm just saying, I want a little more heart from this guy. Hard-driven, missionary, on task, purpose. And then it happens. In 2 Corinthians, the great apostle spills his heart, and I get to see the heartbeat and humanity of a road-weary apostle. It's late in his ministry. Corinthian opposition is hardened against him. Some of his own Christian community drifted away because of outside influences. He feels like he's loving more than he's being loved in return. He's escaped Damascus, feared for his life in Asia, carries a thorn in his flesh, here he is, our great New Testament hero, but he starts off this letter to the church he loves, confessing that he is utterly 
beyond measure, weighed down, and despairing of even living at all. And he confesses that he has conflicts on the outside and fears within. And finally, I found a guy I can identify with. kind of strikes me like the songwriter Paul Simon when he said, why am I getting soft in the middle when the rest of my life is so hard? See, I can identify with that. Sometimes even the great heroes of the faith sing the blues. And there may be no better blues line in all of the New Testament than Paul saying, Afflicted in every way, conflicts without, fears within. It's not something we talk about much. But every honest person in here could confess conflicts without and fears within. In spite of what we're posting on social media. Our, our Facebook posts don't lie, they just tell part of the story. Uh, we post about fine dining experiences and grand events and family gatherings that would make Norman Rockwell jealous. We present to each other our idealized self, but we rarely get honest about the fact that we carry conflict without, fears within. But I know you have them because I know something about your prayers. Now, you'll be grateful to know I have no way of listening in on your prayers. Your prayers are between you and God and there's no cartoon bubble over your head that lets anybody else see your petitions to God. But I do know there is one prayer that you pray over and over and over. There is one pleading prayer that occupies most of your prayer life. And when the day is over and the TV is turned off, it's the one thing you can't get out of your mind. Which is why you sometimes keep the TV on or read a romance novel till you fall asleep or play video games. Because if there's any idle time, if there's any quiet space, you're reminded again of the conflict without, the fear within. And one of the challenges of preaching is that each of you has come in here with a different burden. Your prayer is different. No two stories are the same. And our consuming prayer changes over time. What I am praying, howling at the moon at night about is not the same thing it was 10 years ago. Each aching heart in the room has a different pain, but we are all praying in some part of our life, God, deliver me. For one in the room, it might be that another mother, Mother's Day has passed and the fertility medication is still not working, and God, please. For another, the car needs work. My son needs braces. My son trust alert has told me I'm overdrawn again. God, please. Most of my friends were invited to her birthday party. I was not invited. I feel shut out and worthless. I have no friends. God, please. He's usually not this forgetful. But in the last few months, he started repeating himself. He started, re started misplacing things. And somebody too casually said, early onset Alzheimer's, God, please. He's not right. I don't, I don't know if it's drugs or alcohol or if he's just lost, but he's not right. And I don't know how to help him. God, please. Since her death, I feel so alone. 
The kids are busy, the grandkids are busy, the house is big and lonely, and I wonder if anybody cares that I feel this alone. God, please. And the doctor said the two most vulgar words in the English language. She said, malignant and inoperable. God, please. You see, we have as many prayers as we have people in this room, and I don't know what yours is, but I know that everybody on every pew brings some prayer for release, and the preacher scrambles to know how to speak to so many different kinds of pain. The Apostle Paul was writing to a gathered room that had all kind of gathered pain. They were being persecuted. They were afflicted in other ways. He is aware of their pain. He's aware of his pain. There are conflicts without. There are fears within. He knows what personal pain looks like, and he writes us this to remind us that our Christian journey does not come with bubble wrap. We're not protected from the physical and emotional pain that the rest of the world experiences. The victorious Christ lives within us, but as Paul says, we have this treasure in clay jars. We are afflicted in every way, perplexed, persecuted, struck down. In fact, in the few cases, the Christian commitment creates more problems like it did for Paul. I have a friend who really was a drug dealer. He, well, he wasn't an on-the-corner street pusher. He was a drug runner when Christ's love found him and changed him. He would pick up drugs in the panhandle of Florida and drive them to Chicago. His family lived here in Atlanta. They had a pretty normal life here. All they knew was that daddy traveled a lot for work. He'd leave home with a sport coat. He drove a Taurus. He had one of those bars across the back seat that you hang your clothes on. So he would look like any other businessman traveling up and down the road. Except that his trunk was full of taped up packages. He had an apartment in Chicago, a condo there. Just had cash stashed everywhere. And his children, his two girls, never questioned why they were the only family in the neighborhood that had a wicker basket in the hall full of cash. Mom would call out, get some lunch money. Oh, yeah, uh, uniform money's due this week. Uh, Get in the basket, get what you need for today, take it to school. Well, when he became a Christian, everything about his financial reality changed. He stopped his former life. He tried to get away from the very real anguish and pain of that life. But his Christian commitment in this case created new problems. He had no job. He had no resume. He had no references. And the money was running out quickly. Now his story is pretty rare. The truth is that it's seldom the case for most of us that our faith creates new hardships. But it's true for all of us that our faith does not protect us from them. The baptized life comes with all of life's usual doses of pain. We are afflicted in every way, perplexed, persecuted, and struck down. But Paul's response to this is not to go to a corner and get in a fetal position. After a long season of persecution and rejection, physical pain and disappointment, the apostle is honest about his pain, but he's not a victim of it. There is a power within. There is an awareness of Christ's victory that he carries so he can stand toe-to-toe with all that life doles out. And so Paul says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, 
perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our bodies. Affliction is part of the Christian experience. But feeling crushed by it isn't. We feel perplexed like everybody else, but because we are people of hope, we are not driven to despair. We may feel persecuted. But the spirit of Jesus within us means that we are never forsaken. And even when we are struck down, we will not be destroyed. This power to overcome is not just sprinkled among a few of the chosen believers. Every believer who is aware can access the confidence of Paul in the face of adversity. Some of you were here Wednesday night, heard Dan Hayes speak. He just finished a beautiful four-night series on prayer. He told the story about doing an interview with a student who had called him And he started talking to the interviewer about his efforts to enlarge and care for his inner life. And the interviewer had no idea what he was talking about. But our inner life, our internal realities are where our hopes and fears live. It's where our motivations and our goals are formed. Where we sort out what is temporary from what is eternal. And Dan spends time there, you can tell. The rooms of the inner life is where hope is nurtured, where the comfort of the Holy Spirit lives. And when we retreat to the inner life in prayer, we find perspective. And in the silence of that space, we can say, afflictions, yeah. But I've experienced affliction before. God's carried me through. God will carry me again. I will not be crushed. Yeah, I'm I'm perplexed. I don't understand. And when I'm quiet, I realize that there's a whole lot I don't understand. And that God is God. And that God loves me. I will live in hope, not in despair. I feel lonely, on edge, persecuted. Some people feel kind of outside the mainstream. You remember the line from George Goebel on The Tonight Show when he asked, do you ever get the feeling that the world was a tuxedo and you're a pair of brown shoes? Some people feel that way. But in my prayer, when I spend time inside, I know the companionship of Christ and that I'm never alone. The one who is victorious over death lives within me and I will not be destroyed. Paul had a big inner life. I urge you to stay away from feel-good preachers that tell you that somehow the Christian life immunizes us from the gravel of everyday living. It doesn't. It did not protect Paul, and it does not keep us from experiencing every life experience. But there lives within us one who has conquered every enemy, and his power lives in your prayer life. So keep praying that one prayer. Keep knocking on that door. But also make time to listen. To stretch out your inner life of prayer so that it can make more real the promises and more sturdy the assurances. Because we will continue to face conflicts without and fears within. But the spirit of the living Jesus lives within us. We will never be crushed, and we will never be alone. Thanks be to God. But go now 
in this benediction. The good word that Jesus goes wherever you go, that his comfort attends you in your affliction, and that you carry with you the power of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us again at Second Potsdalian Baptist Church. As you can tell, we take worship seriously. It's a central part of who we are as the people of God. And every Sunday we're together, there's a sense of expectation and vibrancy. But worship is only a part of who we are as God's people because we're also doing life together here. We play together and learn together and serve together, laugh together. We take meals to each other when babies are born and we see each other's children in plays. We eat dinner in each other's homes. We go to each other's bedside when we're sick. In one of her books, author Brene Brown makes a great distinction between fitting in and belonging. And at Second Punch, you don't have to worry about fitting in. This is a place to belong a place to bring your real self and find community. We're always happy to have you worshiping with us on your screen at home, but I also want to extend an invitation for you to come and be a part of the rest of our life together. Life is hard and we shouldn't do it alone. So I look forward to welcoming you in person one day soon.